he had been abused for years from the time he was six. Mm. He had been, you know, uh, sexually abused by groups of men. And at one point he came home and he, from school and he was alone because his parents were both working and the other kids were not back yet or whatever. And he saw the front door of his house was blown open. And he went around the side and a window was blown open. He said it was like a bomb had gone off in the house. And he was terrified. It was getting dark. He was alone. He was young. He was scared. And this man showed up who put a blanket around him and said, it's all done. And then he doesn't remember anything after that. But he said from that point on, he was never touched again. And then, you know, of course, having been so badly traumatized as a kid, he found himself one day trying to go over the balcony, you know, one foot over the balcony and the other ready to go over. And uh, suddenly he felt this wave of intense love just come at him and it made him step back from the balcony. I mean, it was like, you know, it, it just brought him back. And again, he didn't know why this had happened or you know what it was connected to. And then many years later, he got involved in a relationship with a woman in the US. And when he and is now married to her, by the way, a <laughs> good relationship. And uh he was in the US. And at one point he saw either the cover of a book or an article or something or another that had a picture of Maharaji. And he looked at it and he said, that's the blanket that was put. Yes, and that's the man who put it on me. And as I was interviewing him, when he was telling me about how he could remember that blanket, you know, and how he could remember the feel of it and the smell of it. And he said, I'll never forget that day, he said. September 11th, 1973. And I just stopped in the interview and I went, oh my God, do you know what that day is? He said, no, that that's the day Maharaji left his body. Hey everyone, welcome back to the Above the Veil podcast. My name is Ryan Brown, and today we have Parvati Marcus with us. Parvati, welcome. Hi, yeah, nice hi. to be here. <laughs> Good to have you. So yeah, for, for folks who might be new tuning in, the, uh, the point of the podcast has been to sort the various pieces of the spiritual puzzle, if you will, for spiritual seekers to sort what goes where, how they can fit together in regards to their own path and journey, considering there are many roads that can lead home. So uh, today, we're going to get to discuss a significant piece of the puzzle, which in one hand can be confusing at times, hard to understand, in some cases controversial, and in the other, it appears to be a road that leads home for many. So today, that would be on the guru or guru-ness. And so luckily, we have Parvati with us to be able to understand this piece of the puzzle better. So She's actually coming out with a book on August 16th called Whisper in the Heart, which is, uh, which are stories of Neem Kula Baba, a God-realized saint, or best known as Ram Dass's guru. And the, these stories are actually encounters, interactions, connections made with Neem Kula Baba well after his passing and leaving the body in 1973. So these uh these stories are quite extraordinary i had the privilege of reading through quite a few and it, it was also cool to see a lot of well-known names that we might be familiar with i got to hear duncan trussell's story well-known comedian and podcaster there was uh trudy goodman's story who's well known in the vipassana breathwork space does work with jack cornfield and trauma work and as well as trevor hall a well-known artist east forest another artist and Parvati, I was actually curious. Did uh, did you ever reach out to Julia Roberts? <laughs> I heard that she had a story, and apparently, I've seen I'm the photo. sure she does, and I'd love to hear her story. Yeah. But um, 
getting through to her is not easy. Yeah, probably. <laughs> I was curious. I thought that would be cool, but uh, yeah, that'll be for the next book, right? So <laughs> next one, right? <laughs> exactly. So yeah, so the book comes out August sixteenth. Uh, anyone can pre-order it now. I'll make sure there's a link for it in the description below. So highly recommend. So as far as a place to start, Parvati, probably a good place would be with your own story. I know you started out at the very beginning connecting with Ram Das right after him coming back from India in, what was it, 1960? He came back in 1968, just started speaking at various places across the country. And then in the summer of 69, he was staying at his father's farm, far, a gentleman farm, shall we say, <laughs> in New Hampshire, in Franklin, New Hampshire. And that's where I met him. Okay. I had, I had um, gone to a party with uh, my cousins. My cousin was teaching at Goddard College okay. in Vermont. And I went to a party of educators there. And there was a guy in the corner playing the guitar where I naturally headed. <laughs> and he said to me, uh, you want to go meet a saint? Now, three weeks before, I would have said, absolutely not. They don't exist. <laughs> But three weeks before, I had taken acid for the first time. Mm. And I had gone into an experience of oneness. And as I was coming down from the trip, somebody handed me the Tibetan Book of the Dead. And as I was reading that over the next few days, going, mm-hmm, mm-hmm, yeah, that's what, yeah. <laughs> it was sort of like a description of what I had just been through. I said, there's something going on here. Okay. So when this guy said to me, hey, you want to go meet a saint? I said, yeah, sure, why not? <laughs> you know? Yeah, why not? Right. And uh, we drove back down to New Hampshire and drove up to Ram Dass's father's farm. And Ram Dass was standing outside the the front door of the main house. I, I guess he heard a car coming up or something. And he's standing there in his white robe and his bare feet and his beard and doing his mala. And I looked at him and I was straight. I hadn't smoked anything. I hadn't dropped anything. <laughs> this is the 60s we're talking about, people. And, um, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and all I could see was light coming from him. And I was blown away. I, I couldn't even speak. I mean, all I could see was him radiating light. And fortunately, the guy I was with had a conversation with him. And Ram Dass basically told us to go walk around in the woods, you know, meet some of the people that were there. And that evening, we would all get together and talk. There were maybe a dozen people who were living there at the time. We're talking about the people who became Krishna Das and Rameshwar Das and all these other people whose names you know at this point. And um, each one of them, as we met all these various people, each one, I looked at them and I said, where do I know you from? Where did you go to school? Where did you go to camp? Why do I know you? <laughs> I mean, these were strange people. They were walking around going, namaste. <laughs> Didn't know what was going on. <laughs> anyway, that night we all got together in the barn and Ram Dass talked, and he was talking about taking thousands of acid trips and how you go up and you can meet God and you still have to come back down. He said, but then he went to India and he learned that you could do that without drugs. And I said, great, I'm in. <laughs> oh. So was everyone... Was everyone living living at the farm at this point? Was it just visiting? Those, the that, that group of people were living there already. Okay. Wow. Okay. I mean, we're talking about tents pitched in the woods around a three-hole golf course. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I read his dad would come out to, I guess. <laughs> I, I used to make raspberry jam with his dad. I mean, you know, it was That won him over, right? Yeah. <laughs> and anyway, three days after I moved in, I mean, I, I spent the rest of the evening actually convincing this guy i had just met that there was nothing he'd rather do than move in for the summer to this place because i didn't want to live in the woods by myself so... no kidding so you stayed there the whole summer so i stayed there the whole summer and three days after we moved in you know ramdas at one of the early morning mood tea gatherings said anybody here type and i raised my hand and uh, i became his secretary for mm -hmm. the summer so, which was perfect because instead of being out in the woods with these people who had met him earlier 
in the past year and or already, you know, doing meditation and being vegetarian and doing all this good yogi stuff. I had no idea about any of that. So I started typing up Ram Dass's mail. He was getting snail mail back then, <laughs> you know, from people, from the talks that he had given. And he would record all his answers on a cassette machine. And I would type up all his things. So I started learning all the words. I started learning all the concepts. I started getting his, you know, whatever he was sharing with these people, yeah. you know, as so I started learning what was going on. Yeah. Yeah. Gosh. After that summer, I went back to New York because I was going to earn some money so that I could go to India at some point. We all felt the same way there that whatever Ram Dass had gotten, we wanted it from where he had gotten it. Yeah, I bet. Yeah. <laughs> and yeah. he wasn't telling us Maharaji's name. He wasn't telling us where he was. He wasn't supposed to be talking about him. <laughs> right. Yeah. And it was all he could talk about. Right. You know, so we yeah. wanted to go find Maharaji. Yeah. I, yeah. <laughs> <that's> interesting <laughs> hearing all these original talks he gave transcri transcribing, but Still somewhat of a secret. I know in the book he mentioned Marhaji didn't want this mentioned yet of just people uh -huh. randomly showing up in, in India. So right. when did when did that uh invitation come about per se, where all of a sudden the name is mentioned and what happened was that there there were a group of there were a couple of people who were planning on leaving right away for India. And they were gonna find Maharaji. I mean, there was just you know, they were at it. And there were seven of us in a room with Ram Dass at one point. And this was after that summer. This was like in January. We were up in Montreal where some uh, radio broadcaster wanted to interview him. They had been playing his tapes on this, you know, sort of hip radio, FM radio station in Montreal. Nice. So a group of us from New York hopped into a car and went up to, to see him because we hadn't seen him since the end of the summer. And at that point, he said to these two people who were planning on leaving, like immediately, <laughs> he said, okay, I will tell you where to go. I, I guess he overheard, heard where. <laughs> and it was like, along. and it was sort of like, you know, it was the wedge. <laughs> yeah. That and the fact that uh, Krishna Das, Rameshwar Das, and Jagannath Das, who is Danny Goleman, yes. the guy who wrote you know, emotional, emotional intelligence. intelligence. Yeah. yeah. Uh, the three of them had written, had, uh, Ram Dass had given them KK's address okay. in Manital, and they had written letters to Maharaji. Oh, well. And there's a whole story about that that I'm sure you you yeah. haven't come across yet, I guess. I, I wasn't aware. I don't know if there's right. a short version or I guess they sent a letter in. They sent letters, and originally Maharaji said, "Nay, tell him not to come." Okay. And, and KK did his famous pouting, and Maharaji finally agreed that, "Okay, tell them they can come." Wow, no kidding. So God. it was like finally there was permission, and there was Ramdas finally giving us the clue of of where to go. Okay. Okay. So they they came back first, right? And then you went in seventy one. Well, some of them, you know, some of them went in 70. Yeah, when you read Love Everyone, you know, the book I did before Whisper, mm -hmm. that sort of chronologically takes you through who came first and how they got there. And okay. and it takes you chronologically through the Westerners with Maharaji. Okay. Okay. Gotcha. Anyway, to go back a little bit, after that summer of 69 with Ram Dass, I was back in New York and... I had gone to visit a college friend and we had split a tab of acid that split only on my side. <laughs> and uh, I went into some amazing, you know, experience. The next day I was still not completely down and I was going into astral realms of people looking for help and hands reaching up and I got scared. And I took the little black and white picture that, Mar that Ram Dass had given me of Maharaji and my wooden mala beads that he had given us that summer. And I sat in front of this little picture of Maharaji going, I'm scared and you've got to help me. I mean, it was a time when Ram Dass was off on the West Coast and he was at Lama where, where there was no phone, couldn't get in touch with him. I hadn't yet met the person who would be my first meditation teacher, you know, and 
I, I had nobody to ask about what was going on. So it was, I just sat there. I'm scared and you've got to help me was my mantra. And suddenly the picture sort of turned into blue light and I could see Maharaji moving behind, you know, within that light. And it was only like that. I mean, it was just a second of, of that, but it was enough for me to know he was there and that everything was okay. And I could lie down and go through the rest of the experience, you know? Well, needless to say, after that, I got a much larger picture. <laughs> and I basically lived my life in front of this picture of Maharaji. I used to talk to it, you know, all the time. And, you know, I, everything in my life, I sort of ran through that picture. Wow. Yeah. And I sometimes would see him in it. You know, it was, it was, I didn't tell anybody, you don't, at that point anyway, you didn't tell people you walked around talking to a picture. Yeah. So... <laughs> But when I finally got to India and I finally got to Maharaji, uh, which was in September of 71, when I finally met him, the, one of the first things he said to me is, he used to talk to my picture all the time. He said, you asked many questions. Oh. <laughs> wow. That's amazing. Gosh. And that's how I know that people can meet him without him being in the body. Yeah. Because I met him before I got to India. Yeah. Yes, I know this was a uh, common theme where people would meet him through photos or dreams or through Kirtan and, and et cetera, with experiences like that. So, right. yeah, hopefully through those stories, we can start to understand, you know, what the magnitude of, of it being like this. I know the omniscience and om omnipresence is a theme right. where he would just somehow know everything, right? Yeah, time and space are irrelevant, basically. Yeah. So, so before yeah. getting to those, I wanted to hear, I mean, what was it like being, being in, in the presence of, of him? Incredible. You know, it, I mean, it's indescribable because most of us, the grand majority of us never have an experience of unconditional love. Mm. You know, even as loving as parents may have been or not, <laughs> even as, you know, your lover may or may not be, um, it, it's always conditional. Yeah. There's always something attached. With Maharaji, it was absolutely unconditional. There was no judgment, and which was extraordinary in the fact that you knew, he knew literally everything about you far more than you knew about you. <laughs> so he knows everything about you and he unconditionally loves you. At all times. <laughs> At all times. <laughs> yeah, which does seem indescribable considering we, we try to <laughs> embody that ourselves, right? Unconditional love. But I think as human beings, we are conditional beings, unfortunately. So we can only hold right, so much at least that. In until the point where our consciousness expands to the point where we yeah. become that, right. you know, one with it all. Right. So, yeah. 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 And so how long were you there for when, when you were there in 71? Well, I was in India for a year, but I didn't meet Maharaji. I, I came at a time of year when he was traveling and you know, nobody would know where to find him during the, the winter months. Yeah. So I was with him for seven months. It's a good amount of time. Yeah. So what, what was it like? It was in and out. I mean, he would jow us periodically. Jow means go. Right. You know, right. and there were times that he would jow us and, you know, not come back for two weeks or no come back for a week wow. or, you know. And so we would go off and do a Vipassana course, hmm. you know, with Goenka and Bodh Gaya, you yeah. know, or something, you know, or go to Benares and hang out on a houseboat for a while, <laughs> you wow. know. But we were always coming back to him as soon as we would know where he was. Yeah. And, and so during those periods of time when you were with him, what what would the activities be? What what would you what would you do with him? The activity was sitting there and staring at him. <laughs> yeah. I mean, you couldn't take your eyes off him. And you you didn't sit there and meditate. I mean, if people tried, he would, you know, toss an orange at them and that would be it. <laughs> you know, it was like it was just watching him and laughing. And I mean, he was funny. He was not a typical Hindu guru. Women were not on one side and men on the other. 
there was no formality. Well, I think this is this is the hard part to I think when people first start hearing these stories, it's like it's it's kind of like what is going on? Like what is this? You, you can't conceptualize it, and you just have these plethora of stories that you do your best to make sense of. And I think right. and it's hard to make sense of. I mean, Ram Dass would talk about and be here now how you know a teacher kind of points the way the guru is the way and so it's it's this different idea where you're not doing necessarily a separate practice how your practice is is on the guru almost and and so you know spending time with him your eyes are on him you know that that appears to be the meditation and i think what appears to be the case being being a divine personality is part of the grace seems to be the the humanness the relatableness i mean it just seems so simple you're just saying that like, nothing extraordinary is happening but all internally and so you're just sitting in place and so yeah. I was wondering with as simple as it is that's what <laughs> from the outside looking in it's just an old man <laughs> wrapped around a blanket <laughs> that's just, it. what is going on here it's just like it, it's yeah. hard to make sense of and so yeah. I, was, I was wondering with maybe whether yourself or other stories I think that's where we get in trouble because we look for kind of legitimacy and making sense of it through like powers and kind of the fanciful doings and abilities. And I think that's where we get in trouble and we see some, you know, some events where that ends up kind of tarnishing the name of what a guru is with events such as like OSHA, you know, in the West coast where we heard in the eighties and, you know, we have instances, I know Ram Dass would talk about instances with Swami Muktananda and Trungpa Rinpoche with a, a characteristic of power involved. So I don't know if you're aware of those stories at the time, but I think that's what can. Oh, uh, yes. <laughs> yeah. So that's what creates some resistance, you know, when hearing about a guru, it's writing, it's just like, Absolutely. oh, it's another guru Absolutely. guy. It's another one of this, another one of that. So mm -hmm. how did you come to means? Did you have resistance at the time or, you know, not a warming up immediately? You know, did you have doubt? I mean, when I, when I actually was in his presence. Yeah. Well, let me tell you, I had been at that point with, any number of these gurus. Hmm. Oh, I had met them. I had spent time with them before. I mean, because they were starting to come to the West at that time. So I had spent time with Muktananda. I had spent time in India with Sai Baba, who was called the Avatar. I, you know, Muktananda was, you know, I don't remember what he was called, you know, <laughs> all these grand titles of all these beings. And with each of them, I kept feeling something must be wrong with me. My heart is so closed. I can't open up to them. I don't want to touch their feet. I don't want to, you know, it's like, you know, this is not for me, <laughs> right? Yeah. And, <laughs> and then when I met Maharaji, it was instantaneous. I instantaneously was totally surrendered to him because you can't surrender. I mean, you can't make yourself surrender to somebody. All you can do is have that experience happen. Yeah. It's it's not something you force in any way. It's something that is in the instant. And in the instant that I met him, that's what happened. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah, I could imagine that time where all these spiritual beings are coming to light from the West and you're interacting mm -hmm. and hearing these stories, but not feeling that yourself. So right. I could imagine that feeling and then... I know this was a, a theme in the book and then this was just one of the quotes mentioned, but many people who, again, these were interactions well after leaving his body, they mentioned mm -hmm. the feeling that I'm left with most of all is that Maharaji gives me everything I need spiritually. All questions are answered when I think on him. So uh, the bottom line always in all the stories is I felt like I was home. Yeah. Uh, you know, home being that place of total safety you know, total nurturance. Yeah. Yeah. You know, sounds, sounds nice. <laughs> out of love. <laughs> yeah. So I, I'd love to hear actually, because I think it is important because I think similarly to the way you felt where people are hearing stories or trying to open their mind to these ideas, but are not feeling that connection and can start to wonder what's wrong with them or that this, this is not mm -hmm. the case. So if you're aware of any stories where people aren't feeling that connection immediately, I know we talked before, I, I saw the interview you did with Nina facilitating and and Maribai, and I know Radha, who you right. travel with at the time, had an experience where it wasn't an immediate warming up to. Right. Um, 
And that's actually been my experience as well. It took some time. So yeah, if you can, whether it's her story or other stories that come to mind from the book where it takes some time, maybe. Um, oh, there are definitely stories in the time where people, you know, attended, you know, retreat after retreat with Ramdas, you know, and always saw Maharaj's picture and they chanted the Chalisa and they did this and they did that, but they never really thought about Maharaja. You know, they thought Ramdas was their guru, despite him always going, it's not me, <laughs> it's him, you know. And uh, there are stories where they say, you know, it took a while, but I finally came to understand that Maharaji was my guru. You know, that some, you know, not everybody's story is the same. They're, I mean, that's what's remarkable. Everybody comes on their own path. Right. Yeah. yeah. I know there are stories where a seed was planted at a very young age in an encounter, and then it ends up showing up 30 years yeah. down the road. Somehow. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> All in the divine planning, I'm sure. So, right. <laughs> right. So, yeah, to transition into yeah. some of those stories, because um, so I can only imagine for you, you're there in 71, having this homecoming experience, and then right. all of a sudden you hear him passing in 73. So, probably jarring at the time, thinking, like, oh, <laughs> homecoming. And now this is like, <laughs> right. what do I do now? But it appears the accessibility of him continued on. And if anything was more accessible for people. So after, um, after yeah, but it wasn't a smooth instantaneous transition to that. <laughs> yeah. I could imagine. Yeah. yeah. You know, I mean, we're talking about many years. I mean, Krishna Das talks about this a lot, mm -hmm. you know, how for, you know, the next 10 years, he was just inconsolable. It was that long. Wow. Yeah. Oh my goodness. Wow. Yeah. I mean, you know, it's, I mean, imagine that you you have been in this space with somebody where everything is is love, and it's gone. Yeah. I mean, I was one of those horrible people who had to be up front at the tucket so I could touch his feet, you know, so I could feel the fringes on the blanket, so I could, <laughs> you know, I, I mean, tangible. Yeah. Be, you know, it was very tangible and. I mean, even today, just imagining myself sitting in front of the tucket and feeling the fringes on the blanket is enough to bring me back into that space because the connection was so was so strong, Gosh. you know? Uh, so missing that physical connection was very, very difficult, you know? It's just like people think, oh, were you in bliss all the time when you were with Maharaji? He said, no. I mean, he put us through incredible. I mean, I you know, half my time I was laughing, half the time I was crying. It was, right. <laughs> the light is so bright. It illuminates every bit of darkness left within you. Right. And then we have to go back into and our then we purification have to go back process. Into our or, we're not there yet to receive it all the time. <laughs> right. Or as Ramdas used to put it, he said, Maharaji is pouring out this love, he said, and how much we get is how big our cup is to receive it. He said, it feels like my cup is only this big, <laughs> you know? Yeah, no, that's a really good way to put it. Um, yeah, yeah I, I think we'll, we'll touch on that, the idea of Guru's grace, because we, we talked about the idea of grace in our last video, and it's mm -hmm. always being given. It's just whether how much we can receive or even open to receive. So yeah, we, we can touch on that. So yeah, to give some of that tangibility, even though it's out of form, uh, leaving his body, <clears throat> you know, collecting all these stories well afterwards of people having yeah. tangible encounters and interactions, as crazy as that may seem, you know, uh, collecting all these stories, if you could maybe detail a story or two that do any of them come to mind? I know you've... Yeah, I I, I was just thinking right now um, about the... the uh... He, he worked so often just through the minutia of your life, mm. you know, not through, it's not like this grand image people have of you're sitting in meditation and, you know, you rise up through your seventh chakra and you merge into, you know, bliss, you know, it's more like it's coming in this way and appearing, manifesting through the earth, through the material world. I'm just thinking of this story here. Maybe I can find this. Yeah, take your time. Okay. Uh, can I read a little story, a short one? Yeah, give a sample. Yeah. Go for it. 
This is from a letter that somebody had written to Ram Dass many, many years ago. He goes, awesome. and she goes, my dad died in January. Being an only child and having lost my mother five years previously, I was engulfed in grief. Luke, my son, and I went to Mississippi to settle things. When I returned home, I latched on to Ram Dass is coming. Hooray. He'll say just the right things. Everything will be fine. The big weekend arrived, two months to the day after my dad passed. I was an emotional wreck, praying to make it to the auditorium to hear the words. My babysitter had backed out, and I was feeling nervous about having Luke there, not wanting him to distract me from my salvation. Ramdas began his talk, and Luke settled into nursing and sleep. He had spoken only for a minute or two when another mom from Lama Foundation pushed her four-year-old daughter in at my feet and said, I have to go, and quickly disappeared out the door. Luke immediately sat up and forgot sleep. They were noisy, of course, and I had to bring them outside. I was so angry, scared, and sure there was no hope of hearing the words that I was beside myself. Now, this is what I mean about being in a very normal, earthly situation dealing with the kids Kids screaming <laughs> right as i sat glumly on the steps i kept hearing laughter a kind of giggling i knew it wasn't the kids they were playing below me and this was coming from above i was angry that someone dared detract from the words that i was having to miss i jumped up to find the culprit wheeled around and there he was that beloved man in the blanket at the top of the stairs he was laughing at me with those twinkling eyes he said though not through words your place is here. It is all here. And then was gone that fast. I can't begin to tell you the healing those brief moments were in my life. I was so set on the form that my salvation had to take. Little did I know that by not being in the auditorium with Ram Dass, that I would be with Maharaji more deeply than I have ever known. It was my miracle of love, thanks to Neem Karoli Baba. Mm. Uh, Yes. Well, too funny. I actually <laughs> wrote, uh, I think this was from Miracle of Love, that book. And uh -huh. it said where Maraji was asked what would happen to his devotees when he died. And he said, what could possibly happen if you call, I'll come. And right. That's what happened countless <laughs> times. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. There are, a num there are so many instances of that. I mean, you know, one of the sections I did in the book was, you know, cry for help. Yes. Yes. I mean, that was like the way I first met him. I'm scared. You've got to help me. Mm. Yeah. yeah. If, if you could detail that, because I think, I know that was my case. And I think for many where we, we reach a low point and, you know, cry for help and cry for help kind of puts, puts this to the test here. <laughs> right. <laughs> here it is to see. So yeah. Did, was there any stories from that section that come to mind? But I, I think that's something that I think a lot of people probably go through. Where... Uh, hold on. Let me take a look. <laughs> oh, until here. Don't want to reveal. Too uh, yeah. Yeah. Here's a short one. Okay. 206. Okay. This is a, a story from Val Cheney, who is Pete Holmes' wife. Hmm. Okay. And uh, Pete Holmes wrote that wonderful intro to the book right. where he talks about spiritual FOMO. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes. Very prevalent. Okay. So this is Val's story. He says, I came to the retreat in Maui because I love Ram Dass. I understood that what Ram Dass was transmu transmitting was Maharaji, but he wasn't in the forefront for me. I saw him as maybe the same as Christ, which was the narrative I grew up with. I was able to access it through Jesus. I had the same kind of upbringing Pete Holmes, my husband, did, very fundamental Christian. We had pictures of Maharaji in our house because of Pete. I would look at the pictures, but I wasn't really interested in engaging in a relationship with him. I didn't know how I felt about it all. When I saw that big picture of Maharaji at the retreat, I got it, but I wondered, am I just trading Jesus for Maharaji? I called him Maharaji Jesus. <laughs> When we came to the retreat, our daughter was eight months old. When she was four months old, she had had a bad UTI with a high fever, and we had to go to the emergency room. She had to get a catheter put in multiple times, and I worried that it was traumatic for her. It was traumatic for us, too, the hardest thing I've ever gone through. When we came to the retreat in May, she was ex acting exactly how she had when she had the UTI, with the exact same symptoms. I fell apart. I knew the way you know when you're a mother what was happening. 
I was rocking her and she was doing this heavy breathing that she had only ever done from the pain of the UTI. Pete was out swimming in the ocean, so I was alone with her, trying to get her to sleep. Her body was so tense. She was doing that breathing and I couldn't get her to relax. I was crying. It suddenly occurred to me to ask Maharaji to intervene. I was very specific. I remember saying, all right, Maharaji, this isn't a test. You don't have to prove yourself. That's not what this is. But here I am, I'm here at this retreat and you're on my mind. And so if you could help us out with this, that would be great, but it's not a test. That's a big Christian thing, don't test God. But it's also that I didn't want to be like, this is your chance to prove yourself and then I'll be in your camp. As soon as I said those words to Maharaji, instantly her whole body relaxed and she gave this deep exhale. And I knew just like I had known that it was a UTI I knew in that moment it was gone, and it was. There was no sign of it after that. I came out of the room and saw Pete in the ocean, and we had a beautiful swim. I was crying as I told Pete what had happened. It felt like we were swimming in love. That's amazing. Gosh, yeah, I know he would He would reference Christ a lot, where he be like people ask, what should I do, Maraji? Be like Christ, go feed people. And it's you know, not in the religious sense, but just to be. Um yeah. you know, I actually Christ and Hanuman are one. Right, right. It's the same yeah. examples. These, yeah, yeah, these personalities. And so I have a question for you because I think this is part of the struggle with this idea of form, right? That there are many examples, not just Maraji, there's Jesus, you know, Buddha, Hanuman. Um and at times where in this person's situation where they're feeling at a loss, they're in need, where people, it's a, it's a surrendering process where they don't know what to do. So they kind of reach out for help. And I, I actually see this a lot in the Ram Das group where people are reaching out for help. And mm. common answer that's given is no need to search, no need to look for help. It's all within, you know, you are God, you are love, love thyself, et cetera, et cetera. And I struggle with this because I, I used to think very similarly where mm -hmm. it's all within, you don't need nothing outside of yourself is needed. It's, you can look to yourself and it, it took my own breaking point where I was reaching my own rock bottom. And mm -hmm. when reaching that rock bottom, I, <laughs> I, I conceded, I conceded to, to admit that I, I don't know, like, I, ju I just don't know the answer. And, you know, you're just practically on your knees at that point, just searching and, and I find, and I found that my, after what unfolded afterwards, my story's more in episode three, I don't need to go more detail, but essentially I, I, it felt more like pride before where, oh, I can do it on my own and such. And, you know, we, we have all these examples of Murhaji, which is this, this paradox of duality where it is a form outside of ourselves, yet he's, you know, in everything within us as well. So it's, it's this paradox. So I'm just curious what you'd make sense of in these situations. Well, it's really just a misunderstanding of what it means to go inside to yourself. Mm -hmm. It's not to your personality. It's not to who you think you are. It's to the big S self. Mm -hmm. It's to the self where God, guru, and self are one. Mm -hmm. So when somebody, you know, so people don't understand that when somebody says, go inside, you know, that it's all inside, what they're talking about is it's in that place within you that is the same place as the guru is. But for most of us, we can't do that. We don't have the connection to our inner big S self. Right, right. Okay. And so... Since God, guru, and self are one, if you go, if you if you take that longing, that yearning, that uh, despair, whatever it is that's bringing you to that moment, and you connect to the guru, supposedly externally, it's happening internally as well. It's like the old thing, you know, you clean your house outside in order to bring some clarity inside mm. <laughs> or the clearer you get inside the more you want to make sure your house is clean <laughs> right okay so that's helpful so when people are it's, saying within it's not looking to whatever you perceive yourself as the answer i mean any opening. real upa, any real sat guru not upa guru not the quote the teachers right. but the one who is it 
<laughs> right? Any one of them will ultimately throw you back onto yourself. They won't allow you, you know, to cling to them. Maharaji left his body. He got us all wrapped around his blanket, <laughs> you know, and then he left. <laughs> Like so that. what what are you going to do? Where are you going to find them? Hmm. <laughs> okay, that's helpful. So okay, we might not sure what we find. Essentially. I mean, if you read all of these stories about all Tibetan masters, I mean, for example, they're always sending their closest disciple away somewhere. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I remember. Yeah, hearing... go build a house out of rocks on that mountain. Yeah, <laughs> he comes back after a year. Job well done. Tear that one down. Build another one. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So having having an openness inside where it's it's not a dualistic place anymore. Where it's no, but you know, it's not to say that you don't have necessarily meet somebody on the outer plane. You know, on the physical plane right. that can bring you into that place. Dr. Larry said it really well. Dr. Larry Brilliant. I don't know if you've read his book, which is really fantastic, too. Okay. Um, check it out. <laughs> what book is uh, that? Uh, what? What book is that? Uh, what is it called? Uh, hold on a second. Uh, oh, it's called Sometimes Brilliant. <laughs> Sometimes, <laughs> Sometimes Brilliant. And it's an extraordinary story because he was one of the people involved in eradicating smallpox. Uh, okay. And he's the one, Maharaji sent him back 17 times to WHO before he got his job there. Um, Maharaji kept sending him away, said, go to Delhi, go to who, get your job. 17, 17 times. times he sent him back. Wow. wow. It's quite a story. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. We'll mention that story. Um, Mm -hmm. yeah, you said he said it best, I guess, with... Uh... Oh, yeah, because the way he said it was that when we were with Maharaji, you know, and sitting in this incredible love that was going on, you know, he said, well, that was his job. He was a saint. That was his job to love us. He said the real miracle was that when we were sitting in front of Maharaji, we all loved each other. Mm. You know, it was because <laughs> you were sitting in that space of love. Mm. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. No, I think it, it's why part of the grace was having a form and something to make it tangible, but it, it is an example to be given because that's the grace, right? We we aren't able to always generate it ourselves from within. It is unconditional mm. love being given as conditional beings to merge more, more and more into that. And so until we hit our big self, our we, big S self. The big S self. <laughs> <laughs> I like that. Yeah. So it is a process. I think having that guidance is obviously. And the thing is, you know, is that he was really a, a tantric teacher in many ways because he used the things of the material world as, mm. uh, you know, I mean, your, your child crying, you know, so you can't be where you want to be to the place where you think you're going to get it. Right. <laughs> yeah. I heard a funny uh, quote that my guru gave one time how people will cry out to the guru asking for this and that, and you're asking for these wishes. And in reality, they're lining up all these people that you, <laughs> that you disdain or contempt to be able to test you further. And in reality, that's what's happening behind the scenes. So yeah, yeah I can relate to that. So, mm -hmm. so would you say at the end of the day, then after collecting all these stories, do you, do you see any differences in all these stories of from love everyone, the stories of people meeting Miraji versus whisper in the heart. Do you, do you see differences much, or it appears to? It, it and... absolutely. Um, how do I say this? I am absolutely thrilled that in my life and my karma, I was able to be with him physically. I mean, it was tremendous grace. However, the people I know who have not met him in the body have as strong a connection to him as any of us who were there mm. and uh, uh you know and are often even more open to that internal guidance than some of us who received it from outside <laughs> right 
You know, uh, Ram Dass used to say this. I mean, I think I quote him in the intro to the book, actually, about, you know, of course, he met many, 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 many people <laughs> over his years of, of, you know, and worked with so many of them. Yeah. And he always said that there was no difference in those who met Maharaji after he left his body than there were those who were with him. Yeah. Yeah, it's pretty remarkable. I don't know if these stories ended up occurring immediately. Communication was different back then, so who knows? Maybe more probably came as of to light as of late. But I remember the story in the book how it was on the day he was leaving his body in 1972. Oh, that's an extraordinary story. That's Paul's story. Yeah. Paul. Oh, okay. Yeah, that sounds yeah. where he. Yeah. I, I think he was like six years old, and I, you know, he was I think uh -huh. eight. Eight or nine years old, and uh, he had been abused for years from the time he was six. Mm. He had been, you know, uh, sexually abused by groups of men, okay. and uh, and then this one day, he, he was the youngest of the, like four kids, and uh, the others probably were. He knows at least one of the others was abused too, so there was something really horrendous going on there. And at one point he came home and he, from school and he was alone because his parents were both working and the other kids were not back yet or whatever. And he saw the front door of his house was blown open mm -hmm. and he went around the side and a window was blown open. He said it was like a bomb had gone off in the house and he was terrified. It was getting dark. He was alone. He was young. He was scared. And this man showed up who put a blanket around him and said, it's all done. And then he doesn't remember anything after that. But he said from that point on, he was never touched again. And then, when, you know, of course, having been so badly traumatized as a kid, he wound up marrying somebody who abused him. Uh, you know, it, it was just became, oh. you know, the whole thing. And at one point, after a 20-year marriage, he finally broke away from the marriage and took his two teenage sons to live with him in a high-rise apartment. This was all in Australia, by the way. Mm. So there was nothing around him uh, with any of, of this information, right? Mm. And he found himself one day trying to go over the balcony, you know, one foot over the balcony and the other ready to go over. And uh, suddenly he felt this wave of intense love just come at him. And it made him step back from the balcony. And suddenly he thought, oh, but what about the boys? I mean, it was like, you know, it, it just brought him back. And again, he didn't know why this had happened or, you know, what it was connected to. And then many years later, he got involved in a relationship with a woman in the U.S. And when he... and is now married to her, by the way, a <laughs> good relationship. And uh, he was in the U.S. And at one point he saw either the cover of a book or an article or something or another that had a picture of Maharaji. And he looked at it and he said, that's the blanket that was put. He goes, and that's the man who put it on me. I mean, this is, you know. Over long after. <laughs> <laughs> long, long afterwards. And as I was interviewing him, when he was telling me about how he could remember that blanket and how he could remember the feel of it and the smell of it. And he said, I'll never forget that day, he said, it was September 11th, 1973. And I just stopped in the interview and I went, oh, my God, do you know what that day is? He said, no, that that's the day Maharaji left his body. <laughs> gosh Ugh, that's so incredible I, on a lot of different levels where yeah. a just seeing how well, it's tough because it requires a lot of faith at times right where you're not seeing it in person or having that reassurance given all the time but for that amount of time to go on where it's happening at that early age it's happening while he's on the ledge and then later on in marriage, it, it wasn't, it didn't just start when he first heard. No. Um, it was happening all along. Oh, and, and he never, you know, 
you can imagine. I mean, <laughs> yeah, and just I can't imagine that feeling. It's like, oh my god, this. <laughs> So Paul's life has totally changed. <laughs> and uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, I remember his story. He mentioned, you know, things have been tight. He has multiple kids, finances. I think some still working through a lot of healing. But yeah, and we talked about in the previous. It was actually based off Ram Dass's speech on the different channels of reality and how once you kind of experience this oneness, this grace, then the other stuff wasn't, wasn't as right. uh, heavy at the end of the yeah. day. So yeah, that's... That's part of the grace, right? If, if we're open to it. Mm. So it, this all comes back to, you know, what, what is the guru, right? <laughs> <laughs> and I, one of the stories that also stood out was, you know, after him leaving his body, someone kind of just staring at the ocean for a long period of time, someone mm. asking like, what, what the heck are you doing? And they're just thinking that he's, he's just so vast. It's everywhere. Well, you've got to understand who that person was. That was Dada Mukherjee. Okay. Dada was one of his Maharaj's closest devotees for 40 years. Mm. He was an economics professor at Allahabad University. Mm. And um, he, he had a, he's got an incredible story, too. Read By His Grace by Dada Mukherjee. Okay. Okay. Yeah. 40 years i'm sure he's got <laughs> he's got stories <laughs> got a story to tell i'm sure <laughs> right I, that was one of the places we would be with maharaji would would be in allahabad at dada's house mm -hmm. right yeah yeah so I, I i actually have one request with the time we have remaining one of the stories that stuck out to me the most this one's more for fun because i i laughed at and it's just <laughs> just all coming together so that i just thought that's my request and then we'll get back into ending okay. with kind of what the guru is. And I think there's another potent story and that gave a sense for the, that, this vastness um, right. that he spoke of. So my, my request, since you have the book in front of you, uh, let me see if I can remember. It was, oh, this story is just so wild. It was it was Hanuman Das, Hanuman Das King. If you have his story, I think I bookmarked it actually. If uh, The one in Taos? Yes, yes. If we could hear that story real quick, because I thought that was- sure. just, let as me far as grace you. goes, it's uh, <laughs> it's fun. <laughs> yes, yes, definitely fun. Um, page eighteen. Page eighteen. Yes. Okay. I was living. You've got to understand who Hanuman does is he he's managed the temple in Taos for many many years. Okay. So you know he's intimately. Hey, you know, yeah, he seemed to be very accepting of the situation. <laughs> <laughs> I'd be freaking out. And he's, he's actually the story of him meeting Maharaji. It's later in the book. Oh, and okay. he met him through a photo. Oh, wow. I was, thought those were two it, separate people. OK, no, those, he was uh, he had been he was hitchhiking and he was picked up by a couple oh, who had a little wow. tiny picture of Maharaji up on their dashboard. And when he saw it, he started crying. And he said, who is that? And they said, and they said his name. And when they said his name, he just, you know, was sobbing. <laughs> and then left him on the side of the road. <laughs> and then left him on the side of the road. Right. And they, it, we never found out who those people were. <laughs> oh, wild. That's the same yeah. person. And then after all these years. Okay. And so anyway, so he got very connected with the temple in Taos and was part of, you know, putting it together initially and, you know, okay. running it all these years. So. Good context. Okay. I context. I was living at the Taoist ashram and managing it. One morning I was getting ready to leave town when a devotee called and said, can you pick me up at the bus station? I asked a friend to take my truck and go pick her up. On the way back, he ran a red light and the police stopped him. He didn't have a driver's license, so they did a check on the vehicle, my vehicle. I'm sitting in the dining room with, at I'm uh, sitting in, at the dining room table in the ashram, and suddenly this devotee comes running in and says, the police are coming to arrest you. They had told him if he brought them brought them to me, he they would not give him a ticket. The next thing I know, a policeman walked in and said, are you John Kane? I have a warrant for your arrest. I was in a lungi, which is like a sarong piece of cloth wrapped around the waist that men wear, <laughs> and a t-shirt. So I asked if I could go put on my pants. When I came out, he was standing in front, the policeman was standing in front of a big picture of Neem Curly Baba on the wall in the kitchen. He said, where is this guy? He's our guru. He left his body in 73. 
Don't give me that shit, the policeman said. I see him here all the time. I see this guy walking around with his plaid blanket. I go to see what he's up to and he turns a corner and disappears. That's happened to me three times in the last two weeks. Okay, but he really is not in his body. <laughs> Casual. The police, the police officer took me to the station. It was about five o'clock in the afternoon. And I asked, well, do I have to spend the night in jail? Yeah, the bail bondsmen are gone. So I'll have to put you in jail until you can see a judge. As he said that, a bondsman walked in and said he could write up a bond for my bail for $125. This was in the late 80s before I ever thought about having a credit card. I didn't even think about bringing money with me. I reached in my pocket and there was exactly $125 in there. Okay, Maharaji, let's do this. <laughs> I got to tell you, to break into the story for a moment. He He's known for doing that, Maharaji. When he left his body, uh, my husband at the time, Raghu and I, wanted to go to India. There was a whole group going, you know, I mean, we just had to. I couldn't believe he was gone. <laughs> I had to go to India and see that. Uh, but we didn't have any money. And suddenly we found a bank account that we didn't know existed that had exactly the amount of money we needed for two tickets to India. So anyway, back to the story. <laughs> we digress. <laughs> we digress. Yeah. All right. So he, I went home. I had a flight scheduled for 830 that night. I was driving down the highway and suddenly I saw the specter of a skinny coyote. How was it even alive? It was in the middle of the road and wouldn't move. So I pulled off the road. As I pulled off the road, my engine exploded. It was snowing and I was 10 miles from town. I hitched hiked back to the house. As I walked in, the phone rang. A devotee said she had a gun and was going to kill herself. I talked her down. She's good, she's still alive. I thought, okay, Baba, you did all of that just so I would be here to get that phone call. As it turned out, the flight was canceled that night because of the snowstorm. The next day, I went to the police station to find out what I needed to do. They said, we don't know what happened, but there's no warrant for your arrest. There's nothing. We're very sorry. Here's your money back and please forgive us. We'll come and visit you. The following day, the policeman that arrested me brought five policemen to the ashram and introduced them to all of us. He kept telling all the other police that he sees this guru, this guy who has left his body, but he's still here. So take care of this place. <laughs> That was like five stories in one. Yeah. <laughs> I thought it was going to be done. And then all of a sudden, the engine explodes. Yes. And this and that's just all right. two pages, two pages of grace. So, yeah. Thank you for sharing that. Um, yeah. So, to to bring all this together, I know there are listeners from various places. I mean, these could be the first stories they're hearing. You know, they could be very familiar, familiar. They could be connected with him already. So, I think. Again, the term guru, it's been appropriated a lot and to various degrees of what it is, you know, this person's a guru in this, this person's a, you know, guru in finances and, and music. Your golf and, guru, you're right. Yeah. Right, right. And then of course, again, the unfortunate case of there, there are a lot of frauds, right? We've seen this time and time again. If there is any inkling of humanness involved, then we're conditional beings, there's going to be some type of lust and power. And, and we've seen these, unfortunately, de uh, demonstrated and, and can create some resistance. But I thought this part in the uh, who was this? I forget his name, but I wrote down his story. It's a paragraph I'll read, but I thought this put it in context as best as we could try to make sense of. But he said, I was asleep, but this didn't feel like a dream. I was receiving darshan from Maharaji. He was sitting on his tucket, and there were 20 or 30 devotees there. He was throwing prasad to some, talking with others, doing nothing with others, but at the same time, he was addressing the karmic needs of each one. I was privileged to perceive that he was also fulfilling his obligations to devotees, not in his presence, as well as tending to beings without bodies who were working off karma in other realms. And still, beyond that, he was working on something that had to do with maintaining the balance of creation on a level that included everyone and everything. And still further, he was firmly rooted in no thing, all done in perfection, all simultaneously. Humility came easier for me after this experience. <laughs> Which. Yeah. Well, guru means, I mean, you know what the word guru itself means, you know, which is the remover of darkness. And there's a difference between, as we said, between the upa gurus who are, you know, 
the teachers, you know, your, your golf guru, your, uh, or, or, you know, a teacher who, you know, is supposedly a guru who then turns out to be, uh, you know, have a human failing and you learn from that as well. I mean, that's also a teaching. And then there's the sat guru and sat means truth. So that is the one who leads you out of the darkness to the truth of who you are. Yeah, no, I, I think it's empowering because I think here in the West, we, you know, this idea of individualism, we think we're, we're giving up our autonomy if, if we're surrendering or we're, we're, we're giving up our own power and, I, I think it's, I forget the quote, but you, you show it on love everyone as well, where it, it, you're not giving up your power. You're, you're gaining the connection to the divine. You're, you're empowering yourself for what you actually are, right? A soul, not getting in the way of our thoughts, feelings, senses, our right. comic tendencies. It is showing that way through mm -hmm. that mess of a, of all it is to, to yourself. And so again, very hard to conceptualize, but luckily we have all of these experiences to, to show how it can lead to ourselves and and at the at the end of the day just it being love right? right i think there's another quote that that's what the guru does is just show you show you to yourself in love at the end of the day so yeah yeah and i don't want to give people the the feeling i mean a lot of the stories that we just discussed were sort of quote miracle stories in a way no. but there are many others where there's no miracles involved it's just over time gradually coming to understand that this is your connection right you know yeah no thank you and so to close out i had a couple quotes that i thought would be good to end with but before i did we still have a few minutes if needed you know if there's any last thoughts that you had poverty again thank you so much if there's any last thoughts you had or you know one question i had was you know considering you have been through this journey for such a long period of time <laughs> you know there it is a roller coaster right it's not all ascension and rising into, no. into it all that is it is in, yeah it's coming to understand that you don't go to god necessarily only through the father only by going up into that mm. but you also go through the mother and that's the earth and it's everything that we need to learn from being in this physical body <laughs> i love that yeah is is there anything you think of when really in need um you know, is there anything? Uh, well, I, I go, I go right to Maharaji. Yeah. I mean, it's my, that's my path, you know? So, uh, you know, he, he told me at one point when I was with him, uh, he said, you used to be Ram Dass's secretary when, you know, when I had been doing, you know, answering Ram Dass's letters during, uh, <laughs> during that summer, he said, but now you're mine. And in English, he used to call me private secretary, private secretary. So I've always felt that my job was taking down these stories and sharing him with people that way. Gosh, understanding the magnitude, that, that's quite an honor and quite the <laughs> seva, the, the service to be able to offer this to everyone. So, so thank you. I highly recommend, I mean, reading these stories. I laughed at many. I cried at some. And... <laughs> So yeah. highly recommend anyone comes out August 16th. Um, so to, to close out, this actually brought me back to a quote that I, I referenced in, in my story and it's by Meher Baba, another realized being. And the quote says that love has to spring spontaneously from within that love and coercion can never go together, but though love cannot be forced on anyone, it can be awakened through love itself. And so whether that's through. Maharaji, Neem Kula Baba, Jesus, Buddha, through your own self, the big S, right? So right. There, there are many roads, many roads yeah. that lead home still. And regardless of where we're coming from, you know, no conclusions need to be made about anything. I think just being open. And I thought that was summed up well with this quote by Rumi. And it states, be certain that in the religion of love, there are no believers and unbelievers. Love embraces all, which mm. it's simple and yeah. profound. So as always, everyone, um, hope to connect soon. Thank you, Poverty, so much for, for coming on and sharing these stories. If, um, if anyone likes, I believe Lisa Jones is going to be on next. She actually had a shared experience during Ram Dass's death. 
And she, Mm -hmm. quote unquote, when putting her hands on his body was taking a journey through the cosmos. So if these stories were helpful, I know Ram Dass has many that'll be on next. And she ran a podcast for two and a half years on near death experiences. So that should hopefully be enriching as well. So hope to see you there. And as always, hope to find you on the other side of the veil in our next episode. So thank you. Stay well.